Welcome back to the Old Fashion On Purpose podcast. So a topic that we have discussed pretty well, pretty well covered, I'd say, over the last couple of years is the topic of chickens. They're kind of the darling of the homestead movement. Um, many folks actually got into homesteading because of chickens. And so it's one of those rites of passages when you are starting to grow your own food and just kind of venture into this old fashioned lifestyle. But I think a lot of the chicken information we've had thus far has been more of kind of that entry level point, right? How to get the chickens, how to set up your coop, how many nesting boxes do you need, that sort of thing. So I know a lot of you have progressed past that point. Maybe you got your chickens in 2020 and now you have a flock that's three years old. Um, maybe you've been doing this for a while. And so I wanted to kind of do a chicken 102 class, if you will. We're gonna take chickens to the next level and get into some of the deeper topics that maybe you've been wondering about and you just haven't been sure how to address. This episode is brought to you by Redmond's Real Salt, which is the only salt I use for all my homestead cooking, canning, fermentation, and it's also the salt of our soda fountain restaurant. Since I can't grow salt myself, you know, obviously, I gotta buy it somewhere, and I've learned that not all salt is created equal. Having the good stuff makes a really big difference in what you're cooking, and it does affect the flavor. I have loved Redmond for years because they mine their salt here in the United States, they use sustainable practices, and it contains over 60 different trace minerals that not only make it taste really good, it's also better for you too. Now, I admit I am a complete salt nerd, so I buy mine in bulk, which just makes sense because it saves me a lot of money and salt doesn't go bad, so you can stash it in your pantry for a very long time. So if you want to give Redmond's a try, whether you're buying a shaker to test drive or you want to do a 25-pound bag like I do, head on over to theprairiehomestead.com slash salt. And don't forget to use code HOMESTEAD to save 15% off. Now back to our episode. So I have the ultimate chicken expert with me today. Dahlia Monteroso is a backyard wow. chicken educator, also known as the president of Chickenlandia, which I love. Um, when she's not teaching classes or doing seminars, you can find Dahlia on the popular YouTube channel, Welcome to Chickenlandia, and her podcast, Bok Talk, brilliant name, by the way, or sharing her <laughs> new book called Let's All Keep Chickens, The Down-to-Earth Guide to Natural Practices for Healthier Birds and a Happier World. Welcome, Dahlia. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. So... I believe it was maybe your assistant or one of someone on your team sent me um, your your name and your picture and they they presented you as a potential guest and your book cover instantly caught my eye because I thought it was such a fun cover. I don't know. Was it hard? Like how hard Thank was it to you. shoot that? Oh my gosh. So it, it's okay. So let me just explain for the people that are listening. It's, it's basically, it's me sitting in my old coop. I used to live in the suburbs. So I had a much smaller coop and I'm sitting in the coop and I'm just like surrounded by all these chickens, like in mid chickening, like they're, <laughs> they're all doing something different. Some of them are like jumping off of a roost and uh, there's like ducks in there. And it's like this, it's like this wild action shot. And then I'm like sitting in the middle with my chicken boots on and holding a chicken. And so it looks like we just like amazingly got this shot, uh, you know, with, with this amazing action shot with all these chickens doing this stuff around me. But what actually happened is um, I, I, you know, was working with a photographer. I got each individual chicken or duck and I put them in an area and then like the chicken would jump off or it would do something and he would take the picture. And then he took the picture of me in the middle. And he, when he got home, when he got back to his studio, he put it all together and he sent me this amazing portrait. His name is Rick Doms. Um, he is an amazing photographer. I just had another photo shoot with him. And I think he just really captured like the essence of Chickenlandia, you know? <laughs> He, he really did. But, and yeah, I was looking at because I just got done shooting a cover for my new book and it was not easy. We had three months of uh, discussions with the publisher on various things, but 
I was just looking at all the little details of like, oh, that chicken's doing this. And like, I was like, there's no way they did it all at the same time. And I figured there was some creative mastering there, but it, it's flawless. Like you'd never know that it was shot at different times. So well done. Oh yeah. And I, I will tell you something funny and you, you'll, you can relate with this if you just were going back and forth with your publisher. I actually like this photo was taken, um, maybe four years ago. So when I pitched my book, I sent this photo along with my pitch because I knew that they would be like, oh, wow, it's, this is a really striking photo. But I didn't want it to be the cover. But when the yep. publishing company saw it, they were like, this has to be the cover. And I fought them so hard. And <laughs> let me just say right, right away, I was wrong. Okay. But I was like, you don't understand. Like, my, I don't look like that anymore. Like, that, you know, I'm in a different coop now. And they were like, you, you got to realize, like, this is it. This is the cover. And so the designer was like, let me just send it to you with, with the title on it, just so you can look at it. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to change my mind, but okay. And so she sent it to me and I opened the PDF and I was like, oh my gosh, like, this looks really good. <laughs> so yeah. I had to go crawling back and it has been like such a selling point. Like everybody's like, Oh my gosh, the cover, you know, they go to tractor yeah. supply, they see it and they're like, I cannot believe this cover. But, um, and so it, it's great. I was wrong. I'm so glad that they knew I was wrong. And, yes. um, uh, but I'm really proud of it. And it's got, it's got a lot of my heart and soul in it. It's not just a, an information book. It's, it's really, I'm trying to, I'm really trying to share like the meaning of chicken keeping, you know, what it, what it means to kind of reconnect with this age old practice. Yes. Um, so there's a lot of that in there too, but it's definitely like a, you know, if you are just getting started or if you've had chickens and you're just wanting to lean in a more natural direction, um, you can use it as a reference book, but I, I, I'll say it's a, I think it's a pretty good read too. And that's, I, I agree. It, the inside is, you know, the cover caught my attention, but once I started looking through it, I'm like, that's why I wanted to have you on is because there's more to it than just your typical one, two, three, here's a formula for backyard chickens. I could tell you've really put a lot of thought uh, and research into kind of how we got here in our current backyard flock situation yes. and where we came from, which that's my, that's my heart. That's what I did with my last book. And I love answering that question. Um, you know, where did we come from? And, and how are we here now? And so I guess let's start there. I'd love to know. Um, well, actually, there's this, this phrase. I think it was somewhere in the book, or maybe it was on the back cover. You said, to keep chickens is to participate in something that is a part of our collective history. Yes. And I, I, I love that. Because so can you kind of expound a little bit on kind of, I mean, you don't have to give the full history of humans and chickens, but how were they, how were they a part of our, our existence before industrialism and, and, um, what role did they play prior to, you know, factory farms and, and our paradigm now? Well, I, I think one thing that people don't realize is that the chicken has literally de been domesticated for millennia. Um, you know, it started out, it was very likely that it started out as fighting, you know, like, you know, cause you know how humans are, so they would fight the roosters um, and then evolved. And it really is something that is common to all of our ancestry. And for me, you know, I even did a TEDx talk about this in 2017, I did a TEDx talk and it was called, I dream of chickens. And in the talk, I discussed how, you know, we can look at our history with the chicken and we can use that as a way to come together as people. Um, because it's really important. That's really important to me, especially right now, because the country, our country and really the world, but our country definitely is super divided. And it's so funny because when I did that TEDx talk, that was in 2017. And I was like, there's no way we could be more divided than we are now. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> Another thing I was wrong about. <laughs> But only the only two things, I'm sure. So. Yes. <laughs> so I, I really feel like, it, you know, something happened to me when I got chickens. You know, I got, I got the chickens and I was like, oh, you know, I, I, I moved 
to Northwest Washington from LA. I was working in the entertainment industry and my husband still works in the entertainment industry. You know, we were all about like that fast paced life. And I had, I was living in LA, but I've lived, you know, I've been a city girl my whole life or suburbs really more appropriately. Like I, I, I grew up in the suburbs. So I was really disconnected from nature and I came up here and I was like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to get some chickens. And when I brought home that box of baby chicks, it was 10 little baby chicks, and I started taking them out of the box and putting them into the brooder, I, <laughs> I don't know. It was like divine intervention, <laughs> like something occurred in me that just opened up this passion and I didn't, I had no idea how that, just that really simple connection with nature would change my outlook about life, would change my outlook about humanity and really kind of set the pace for the rest of my life. And I feel like when we make that connection with nature and we, when we make that connection with our ancestry and realize that this is a shared tradition, you know, it's not new. It's something that almost all of us have in our, in our history that we can kind of use that as a gateway to get closer to each other. Cause when, when we understand our own history more, we will be more compassionate towards other people. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, there's a lot of people that, <laughs> that are like, Oh my gosh, you're taking this chicken thing really seriously. <laughs> And, and it's true, but I, I mean, this has really been my experience and I know I'm not alone because there's a lot of people that connect with what I'm saying and have, Absolutely. have had that same experience. Man, I got chills when you were saying that because it is that process of reconnection. Oh. And I think maybe we say that word so much people, we lose the meaning, but it, it really has so much weight to it um, because we are disconnected as modern people. We're disconnected from nature, we're disconnected from each other and we're disconnected from ourselves. And I think it's that first step of repairing yes. the, the first of those three things. Maybe that's nature for a lot of people. It's as innocent as planting a seed or getting a chicken. It opens you yes. up to thinking about the rest. Yes. And you know, it's so funny because you hear a lot of people, you know, you, you read a lot about like, oh, we need to disconnect. We need to get into, into nature and disconnect. And, and, and I understand when people say that, cause they're talking about you know, unplugging, like disconnecting from all of your devices and all of this kind of overstimulation that we have in, in our modern lives. But when I think about it, I think we are connecting. Like when we, when we walk, when we take a moment and I, I love my modern life, to be clear. I love my modern life. I like my gadgets. I am stupid about my phone. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's, it's true but it's about balance. And so we walk outside, even if it's just for 10 minutes a day, we walk outside, we have that connection and it's profound how much that can change your life. It and I just want everyone is. to have that experience, whether you're in the suburbs or in the city, I want everyone to have that experience. And that's why the book is let's all keep chickens. And that's why it's Welcome to Chickenlandia because it's like, come on, let's do this. Let's get together and and do it. I love that so much. So yeah, people think it's just the chickens, but you we we know it's like, no, no, this is just the beginning. We know what's gonna happen next, and it's yes. a good thing. So yep. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I love to look at like why did you know we have chickens are a part of our ancestry, you know, they've been around with humans for a long time. What happened in, in fairly recent history, in recent, I mean, in the last hundred years or so, that caused us to move away and kind of lose all touch with that? And now so much so that now here in the 2000s, we're like, oh, chickens, novel concept. Like what caused yes. that, that breakage, do you think? Um, it's, a, it's a combination of things. A big one is industrialization. Um, but I think even more than that, because it is possible to have chickens in the city. It is possible to have chickens in the suburbs. There, there can be a marriage of industry and agriculture that isn't unethical. I do yes. believe that. Um, but, 
you know, it's not just that like there, there are really big influences and certainly, you know, in the 1920s, that's when factory farms came on the scene and the chickens were the first animals to go into a factory farm. And that really changed everything. And, you know, before then we had, you know, chickens were part of our everyday life, no matter where we lived. And then the, the chicken kind of came out of the city and, and, and moved into the factory farm. And then there was this idea that, you know, to keep chickens, it was, um, you know, it's low class, um, you know, certainly that was a huge part of it. And then, it, you know, World War II happened, there was a bit of a resurgence, but that kind of fell, fell out of favor again. Yeah. So now we're kind of in this, in this very strange situation where it's like, at one point we were like, oh, chickens are low class and they bring down property value and they, and they bring rats into the neighborhood and all this stuff. So there are all these laws created to keep chickens out of certain areas. And now there's like this other side of that where it's like, well, if you want to keep chickens, you have to, you know, it's very expensive. You have to have all these bells and whistles. You have to feed them this certain stuff or they're all going to die. And it's like, wait a minute, where, did, where is that coming from? You know, we've traditionally kept chickens with like nothing. You know, we've kept them through famine and war and all kinds of, of strife. Humanity has survived with chickens by our side. And now it's like there's these roadblocks um, that are being put up to keep, to keep people from having chickens. And I think factory farm influence has a lot to do with that. And then also just in, you know, in the Western world, just the way that we think about things, um, you know, we tend to overcomplicate, overcomplicate. Whereas if, if you go, you know, my, my, my family is from Guatemala. Uh, my mom and dad were from Guatemala. If you go down there, like there's chickens everywhere, you know? <laughs> and yep. so my, you know, what I want to do, like, I, I, I love my chickens. I don't just let them run all over the place, you know, because I, I don't have a dog or anything that would, I mean, I have dogs, but they're not chicken dogs. They're not good with chickens. Um, so I have them in a, in a predator proof area and, you know, some of the pushback I get from people is like, well, you know, in, in other countries, they just let chickens run around and they get hurt. But I really think that there's a way, you know, there's a compromise that we can make where we take all things into consideration. We take the health of not only our chickens, but our families, our communities, all of that into account. And we, we are able to keep chickens in a way that is humane and gets the most chickens possible out of these factory farms. Yeah. Because if you, if you were to ask a chicken, Hey, do you want to like, um, you know, live on someone's property and run around and, you know, maybe there's a little bit of danger involved. Yes, there could be predation or something. Um, that's, a, that's part of keeping chickens, unfortunately, and we do the best we can. But if you had to, uh, to decide between that and living in a four by four, you know, a, a tiny little cage with chen, 10 chickens in there with you, where you're basically eating each other's feathers because you don't have anything else to do. You know, what would you want? So I try to kind of bring it around because there's there's a lot of educators and there's a lot of people that are like, well, you know, it needs to cost money because then that keeps certain people out, you know, and it's mm -hmm. like, no, yeah. we need everybody to be in. <laughs> we need to, we need to yeah. be building bridges, making things possible. Mm, I love that so much. And it was actually my, one of the questions on my list was to ask you about that association with lower class. Cause I had sensed that in just some various readings and, and such that I've done, but I wasn't sure if I was like drawing that conclusion unnecessarily, but it's so fascinating that you said that because I, I've even felt it. Um, we got our first chickens over a decade ago here in rural Wyoming. And even though it's a farm and ranch community, they, there was still that remnant of like, oh, the wingers got chickens. Like what's happening? Like it was not like, 
expressly stated, but it was like, that's kind of trash, you guys. Like that little bit of that attitude, yeah. which I thought was so funny. And I'm like, what is this coming from? It's food production. Yeah. Food production is beautiful. But you know, there's just overcoming. I think it was probably left over from, you know, that industrial push to to get people to buy, buy, buy. And then we we threw rocks at all the old ways, but it was pretty interesting. Yeah. It, you know, it's funny you say that because, and I, I said this in the book, like when I got, when I first got chickens, somebody said to me, like, what do you think this is? Guatemala? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. And I was like, well, I know it's not Guatemala, but like, yeah. and I, I know what you're saying. Like, I, I get what you're saying, but, um, you know, I think that even though it's the third world and we kind of look at it in a certain way, you know, there's something to be said for the fact that uh, there are a lot of places where they kind of, you know, there was industrialization and the industrialization really harmed a lot of these places, yes. but they still kind of held on to that rural part of themselves. Yes. And I, I really think that we need to make that, you know, chickens and the sound of chickens, even the sound of roosters, all of that, we need to take that, we need to make that part of our ambiance of our neighborhoods again. Because right now, there's a lot of places, you know, where people can't even get fresh groceries, but yes. they can't grow their own food. Yes. I know. You know? I know. It, it and, kills me. And, oh it's against, so it's against the law for them to have chickens, but there's like all these sounds of the city, like, you know, there's like a, a sledgehammer going on outside or people yes. screaming or, you know, like whatever. And it's like, what is it about the sound of chickens, particularly the sound of a rooster that is so offensive? And I think we really need to look at why we think that. Yes. There's, there's some, yeah. I think, underlying it, prejudices there that are popping up. Yeah. And, it, you know, if we're, if we're going to say, oh, you know, we care about the environment, we want to, we want to make all these changes, it's like, okay, make, you know, let's make a sacrifice where you hear a rooster in the morning. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I feel like that's a small sacrifice. I've never understood yeah. why they don't like roosters. Like, I, I guess if they're crowing all day long, but I just, I love the sound. I'm like, I don't know what, the, I don't know what the problem is, y'all. I nice. don't either. I think it's really kind of a subliminal, like, um, you know, it's, it's a cultural thing. And I think it's certainly coming from, um, honestly, like classism and other things in that category, you know, yeah. it's a, I think, I think we really just need to think about it and ask ourselves, why is this sound offensive to us? Yes. You know, and it's such, you know, when I think about the grand scheme of history and humans have always up until very recently, you, you get to have a role in your food, where it comes from and how it is procured. Like that is part of being a human, Yes. whether you're gardening or you're hunting or you're keeping animals, that is hand in hand. And what a bizarre paradigm we live in that you can literally say, no, thank you. It is beneath me to have to worry about where my carrots or my eggs or my milk comes from. Um, it's fascinating that we've gotten there so fast where we've forgotten that this was just a part of existing. Uh, and now we, we judge it based on your economic status and what, where you are in the world and how much money you have. And it's just, it's bizarre. Yes, it is bizarre. <laughs> it is. Yeah. So I love, I love these conversations um, to kind of bring it into a little more, Let's, let's get some practical here for those listening and maybe they're struggling with the legislation that prevents them from keeping chickens. Do you yeah. have any mm -hmm. suggestions for those who may be dealing with those restrictions or HOAs or covenants or those sort of things? Yeah. Um, you know, it's worth it to find out what people's concerns are and then come up with some bullet points against those concerns. Like a lot of people have the same kind of like, oh, uh, chicken smell or they bring, you know, they will bring rats um, or they're too loud. And there are answers to all of these. And there are many towns in the United States um, and beyond where people have chickens and they're, it's going just fine. So I would find out, like, first of all, find out what town what areas around you where people 
can have chickens and think about that success story and bring that success story to your town. If you can, what is super value, what will be super valuable to you is to find a line of communication into your city council. Like if there's somebody there that you can speak to directly and kind of get on your side, um, that can really help. And they can help to walk you through that process. Cause a lot of times, you know, with the city government, it can just get so, oh, <laughs> you know, it's like the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. So if you can get in there and find an ally, that will be so valuable to you, you know, and I, I'm working on what I would really like to do is get like a, um, I'm kind of putting this out, out there so that I can hold myself accountable because I've been working on it for like two years. <laughs> what I would really like to do and what I am working on is getting kind of a mini course because I have an online course. Um, it's called Backyard Chickens 101, a chicken course for everyone. And that is a, a you know, you, you have to pay to take that course. But what I'd like to do is have either like a very cheap or a free course um, to help people to, you know, just kind of walk them through the process of going to their city and getting chickens legal in their city and, you know, possibly having like a letter that they can, um, you know, fill out or whatever to take to them and bullet points to take to them. So that's something that I'm really working on. It's really close to my heart because I want to see chickens everywhere. I really do. Um, that's super, super duper important for me. So. Yeah, but you know, it, writing a book and <laughs> you know, all that stuff kind of took time. You have a few things yeah. on your plates. I know content creation is its, its own animal. Um, oh, but I do, it really is. It really is. I do think there is, I think that would be solving a huge need because I get that question a lot. And I've never, I don't live in town. I have other, you know, issues with chickens where I live, but it's not HOAs and Covenant. So I'm always like, I don't know. Do you, I don't know. Like just start talking to people. But yeah, it would be that's great to have steps. Yeah. And the thing is, is it's different everywhere. So that's why I think the most important thing is to find a line of communication within your city government so that you can work directly with them and find out what's what uniquely you need where you live. But yes, yeah. I will say, yeah, we've just on a semi unrelated, but, uh, but still related. No, we, I, I've never done it with chickens, but we're working with county government right now on some other, so actually starting a school and it can be very frustrating to work with any sort of government, actually. <laughs> so yes. low level, high level. And what we've learned is exactly what you said. Find a point of contact. And then the other, only other thing I would add is you catch more flies with honey than vinegar. And these people are used to being yes. yelled at a lot. So if you can go in and be like, hey, I'm, I want to be friendly. I don't want to scream at you. I don't hate you. I know your job's tough. How can we like come together on this? Um, that's mm -hmm. gotten us a long ways instead of being like all, you know, bristly and angry about it. Yes, definitely. That's the chicken landia way too. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Coming together. So, yes. Okay. So another burning question for you that I get a lot and I have personally this question and I kind of am fuzzy on what to do with it. Um, since we're doing the deep dive today, what, yeah. or how do you tell when a chicken is not laying anymore or has maybe laying less or how can you kind of go through your flock and gauge which ones are your high producers and which ones are your low or non-existent producers? Usually when chickens are laying well, like the, one of the first things that you see, and you'll see this when you, you know, when they're uh, coming in to lay for the first time, their combs will get nice and big and red. Their wattles will be big and red. And they kind of have that laying look where there's a lot of redness about their face. Like I have one naked neck chicken and I just have to laugh because they're just so funny. I love them. Um, <laughs> and she's got, you know, she's got the big red comb, um, the red wattles, but she also has red all on her face and then like down her neck because you can see she doesn't have the feathers like down her neck and on her crop. She's got a lot of redness. So, you know, when a chicken goes broody or when in the winter, you'll see some of that fade. Um, and that is a, a sign that they're not as active laying. So if you, if you see some of that, then it's possible that they have slowed down um, or that they're not laying at all. Um, if you look at their vent, you can 
you can usually tell like uh, a, a chicken that's is laying is going to have a not you know this is kind of gross but like a <laughs> like a, a right. nice puckery uh moist vent it's gonna kind of look like a mouth a little bit <laughs> yeah. um and if you think about like an old lady's mouth you know the thins get the lips get a little thinner you got <laughs> you got you've got the lines starting to come in um you know it's more dry than that chicken is likely not laying Mm. Okay. So, but it, you know, yeah. I mean, I've had chickens that lay like I had an, an 11 year old chicken and she would lay one egg like every three months and I'd have to like bring her inside and put her in a night, you know, <laughs> I almost like, you know, playing soft music and everything, <laughs> but she would, she would come in and lay her egg and then go back out. And she lived she, you know, she laid and really until she died, but they slow down considerably, um, really after the first, I mean, if you think about it, production hens are bred to lay the most eggs that, that they are going to lay in a year in that first year of life. Right. Yeah. And then after that first season, it will drop down. They'll still lay a lot. Um, after the second season, it will drop and they will continue to lay. But um, these chickens were created for f factory farms. And so it's, you know, it's, it, it's advantageous for them to get the most eggs possible from those first year or two of life, if they're lucky, and then they'll get new chickens and those other chickens will be will be cold, honestly, and, and, um, then they'll start over. So I think for a lot of people, they're like, Oh, you know, my chicken's not laying as much, it, you know, when you go into it, you really need to think about what, I'm, what am I going to do when these chickens are laying less, you know, am I the kind of person that's going to have a retirement home for chickens <laughs> or will I need to, you know, am I the kind of person that's able to process them? Will I find a, nice vegan friend to give them to that will take care of them forever. You know, these are the kind of questions that I tell people to ask themselves before they get started. Just so, just so they have a plan. That's yeah, that's wise. Um, I was thinking about this when you were talking, I, I've never thought about this before, but I know you said the production chickens have been bred to lay, you know, the most in the first year and then they taper off. But what about the, like, let's say we had a chicken in the wild or we have a breed that isn't as finely tuned for that production, what would their egg laying look like? Is it more spread out throughout their lifetime or is it kind of mimicking that? Um, gosh, you know, I think that they likely they would lay probably the most as, as younger chickens because, you know, in the wild, their life expect expectancy is not going to be as long as, as if it would be, as it would be if they were domestic. Um, in a domestic situation. Um, but just coming out of the gate, they're not going to be laying like these production breeds lay like chickens have not traditionally laid the way that they lay that we expect them to lay now. So right. You know, now if we go to the farm store, we pick up, you know, a couple Rhode Island reds and some red comets and, um, you know, some leghorns and these chickens are laying, every, you know, just about every day, um, very productive, but there's a cost to that. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not making a, a judgment call on it. I certainly have those chickens in my flock. I, I love it because I get lots of eggs, but there is a health cost to that. Um, and that's why you see little bantams living to be 10, 11, 12, 13. And for a production chicken to make it to six, seven, eight, like that's a pretty old chicken. Yeah. Um, and, and they also, they're not bred necessarily for resilience. Um, they're bred to lay. So there are some very common issues, you know, health issues that can happen and people get really upset and blame themselves. And I'm like, look, you know, this is kind of par for the course with these production breeds for them to have right. these kind of issues. But, um, so yeah, like, re I don't know, jungle fowl, they're out there laying probably a, a clutch of eggs and then they're getting broody and hatching them out and maybe once a season, you know, uh, whereas, 
our chickens are, you know, but I think the record is like 365 days, you know, the, uh, some chickens lay in every single day. And, um, yeah. that's, that's, that's not a, uh, it's not great for their survival as a species, but in a domestic situation, we're able to kind of keep them going. But in, in, in the wild, that would be not, not great for them. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, do you have, do you have a favorite breed that you, that you kind of lean towards or do you do a little bit of everything? I do a little bit of everything. I, I confess most of my chickens are like itty bitty tiny chickens. <laughs> like I do. I do love the like tiny ones that do nothing. You yeah. know, they're just, they yeah. just gripe all day. They're loud and, yep. <laughs> and they get broody, you know, every second. Um, I love those. I got Saramas and I've got old English and, um, you know, I've got silkies. I've got a show, you know, it's funny cause it's a show girl chicken, but he's a rooster. So I call him a show mm. boy. <laughs> okay. Um, but, uh, I, I really like the lighter breeds, you know, the, the Mediterranean breeds, those are just, I mean, they just lay such great eggs and, um, they seem to be very hardy. Now, if you lived in Minnesota, you probably would be getting heavier breeds. You know, you have to look at the climate that you're in. I'm in a, in a fairly mild climate, so I can get heavy and light breeds and they'll do fine because it just doesn't get extreme here um but yeah i don't know i love like anything super funny looking like <laughs> polish frizzled silky you know whatever yeah I, I i love it and i've got tons of special needs chickens too because I, I rescue okay. chickens so. you're, okay you're in the rescue yeah we Yep. had never had Polish and my, my son is doing chicken 4-H. And so he got some Polish, um, for in some of these little show chickens. And that, that is a whole experience with the, the Polish. <laughs> I have not done it before. I'm like, can it see? I don't think it can see. And my kids are like, we need to like yeah, get a little like, hairband yeah, yeah. And, so it can see where it's going. <laughs> um, interesting an interesting breed. <laughs> Yes. Uh, it's so funny because I have one and all her, her name is Pac-Man and all her hair goes to, the, I say hair, like all <laughs> her feathers on her head, they all go to the side. She's got like this total side do. And it's so funny. Like I, I found her like that at the farm store and I was like, okay, she's coming home with me. Yep. <laughs> so she's getting pretty old, but yeah. Yep. I want to take a minute to say thank you to this episode's sponsor, Redmond Agriculture, because they solved a major problem for homesteaders like us, and that is soil testing. In the past, it was kind of a feat to get your soil tested. You either had to do complicated tests, you had to find an obscure website online, or you had to drive to some university to drop off your sample, and Redmond's eliminated all of that trouble. You might remember me talking about them last year because they were the ones who helped me do the detective work on my potting soil drama. And if you missed all that, you can go back to a previous episode to hear that saga. But I have been in love with their kits ever since. And whether you're listening to this episode in the spring or the summer or the fall, there's really no bad time to test your soil. The more you know about what's going on in the earth under your feet and under your plants, the more empowered of a gardener you will be and the better your harvest will be as well. So to give their soil tests a try, they are super easy to use and extremely inexpensive. Head on over to theprairiehomestead.com slash soil test. And if you use code homestead, you can get 15% off your order. Now back to our episode. Um, so you mentioned health issues that kind of come with the production breeds. And I think sometimes, you know, there's just other health issues too. And that's a question that I get a lot is sometimes people are like, I have this sick chicken and they're like explaining the symptoms and, um, we don't have to get into every chicken ailment under the sun today, but I'm just curious, oh, yeah. what do you do for like, um, the common ailments? Like how much can you doctor a chicken? I always feel like I'm a little bit at a loss. Like I was even a vet tech for a while and I can doctor a lot of things, but when it comes to chickens, I'm like, I don't know how doctorable these are. So what is your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, you know, what I tell people is, be, I mean, you can imagine I get messages, a lot of messages uh, from people with sick chickens and a lot of chicken illness presents the same. 
Um, you know, you've got, you walk into the coop, there's a chicken in the corner, they look listless, they're staring at the ground, their wings are droopy, you know, maybe they're not eating or drinking. And by the time a chicken gets to that point, they're usually very sick. Um, because chickens, because of the nature of the pecking order, they will work very hard to, to hide their illnesses. Um, you know, it, if they show weakness, there is a chance that they could get attacked by other flock members. So that's why they have that. And that, and that sounds really awful, but in the wild, that's very useful because weakness in a flock will make the whole flock vulnerable to predation. So chickens don't know they're not in the wild. They still, <laughs> they still yeah. think they're in the jungles of Malaysia. So they're, they're acting on that instinct. So I, I do have a protocol that I give people. It is very easy to remember. And I created this because in my own life, you know, I may seem like I have it together, but I get like super stressed and panicked. Like if I find a sick chicken, I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And so, <laughs> and I'll forget all my knowledge, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I came up with this acronym. It is called REST. So I, I call it the REST method or the REST protocol. It is an acronym R-E-S-T. Okay. So if you can remember that, that's half the battle. And let's talk about what each acronym stands for. So the R, remove your chicken from the flock. Okay. I just talked about how they are vulnerable to, uh, you know, bullying from their other flock members. So it's very important to you know, in order to help them, you want to remove them from the flock. The other thing is they could be contagious. And so, you know, it's a good idea to just get them, get them away from their flock, put them in an area where it's nice and quiet and they can recover. Because if you think about yourself when you're sick, you know, you don't want to be out at the mall, you know, you want to be at home in bed so that you can, re you can rest and recover. So that's the first one R remove your chicken from the flock. The E stands for electrolytes, vitamins, and probiotics. So if you go to your farm store, you will find electrolytes for chickens. There is a recipe for um, electrolyte, you know, homemade electrolytes in my book, or you can go online. Uh, there's many, many recipes for chicken electrolytes, and you can make them at home. Um or, or, or you can purchase it. But, uh, you know, when you purchase it, it usually comes with vitamins and probiotics as well in, in these little packs that they make, um, or, you know, you can get a container with the powder. So hydration is a big concern. You know, when, when anything gets sick, when you get sick, when you're, when your kids get sick or whatever, it's like, okay, you need to drink liquids. Like we're, we're taught that. And that's because, it is very easy to get dehydrated when you're sick. So you don't want your chicken to get dehydrated. You want to get, give them that, that little boost so they can work on getting better. So electrolytes is what the E stands for. The S stands for scrambled egg. Okay. And sometimes people are like, what? <laughs> but I will tell you that there are few times when a chicken will refuse eating scrambled eggs. Like it is just okay. very yeah. tempting to them and you want to get something into them. You know, it depends on what they have going on. Like, obviously if you have this chicken with this horrible compacted crop, you're going to skip this, uh, this, uh, step. Okay. But if you, if you just don't know, you've looked over this chicken, you don't know what's going on. You just want to get some, it's not eating, it's regular feed and you want to tempt it to kind of get some strength and get that will to survive back into it. Then you can give it scrambled egg or something else that you feel will really tempt it. And, and, you know, the more nutrient dense, the better and scrambled eggs got a lot of nutrients in it. Okay. And then the tea stands for temperature control. So, you know, you don't want, when a chicken is sick, you don't want them to have to be worrying, you know, trying their, you don't want their bodies to be working on either staying cool or staying warm. So bring them into an area where the temperature is moderate and they, they're not, you know, their bodies don't have to be working on that so that they can focus on getting well and healing. 
And sometimes, so, so that's it, rest, R-E-S-T. Yep. Now, of course, this isn't specific to any illness because it's impossible for, you know, there's so many things that can go wrong with chickens. Um, and I don't, I don't mean to scare people, you know, it's just, it's just, you know, it's like anything, it's like any animal, any creature on earth. There's so many things that can happen. That doesn't mean that it will happen, but when, when, when illness hits, it's not like you can know right away what's going on and you may need some time to do some research and try and figure out what's going on. Or if you want to, or, and if you're able to seek, uh, care from a licensed veterinarian, then you have that time to call the vet and find out if you can bring your chicken to a vet. I know that a lot of people don't do that or they can't do that. And that's absolutely fine. But I always try to, you know, put that disclaimer in there that like, that's, that's really, that really would be your best course of action. Um, so, but you need, you need some supportive care during this time. And sometimes they may bounce right back and you, you don't even know like what, what happened, but they just needed that time. Like, you know, just to kind of recuperate from whatever happened and now they're okay. And you can get them back out with your, with their flock. And of course, sometimes it doesn't matter what you do. You know, we, I talked about production breeds. There's problems that can happen with them that are just beyond, even with veterinary care, you know, it's just beyond what we're able to do. Um, so, but I, I just wanted to, to put that out there and to create that so that people could have something very simple, just some really simple steps that they could take. If they have that experience, they find that, that sick chicken and they're like, what do I do? I think that's, that's really helpful. Cause it is kind of, I've, at least I have felt kind of helpless in those situations. I'm like, well, uh, I hope you get better, but you, you know, you just don't know what yeah. there, there isn't a, a, like a simple formula. Like sometimes with dogs or cats, you feel like you have more resources and chickens are just, it's just different. Um, what are some yeah. of the most common issues that you see with those production breeds, those ailments that you mentioned? Um, I think the most common issues are uh, reproductive problems, um, getting egg bound, having uh, an infection in their reproductive productive organs that usually happens from maybe an egg breaking inside of them or they're having what's called internal laying and it's caught, you know, it's causing infection. Um, or, you know, sometimes people will just walk into their coop and there's a chicken that was pecking and scratching that morning and running around for its treats and super happy. They walk into the coop and the chicken is dead as a doorknob and they're like, what happened? And they get really, really concerned. Um, you know what, oh my gosh, are all my chickens going to start dying now? Like what is going on? And, um, that is called sudden chicken death. Like there's a, there's a word for it because we have witnessed it. You know, if, if anyone has kept chickens for any amount, amount of time, they've probably experienced it where there's just a chicken that suddenly died. And I will say it's usually a production breed. And it has to do with just an overactive ovulation, overactive reproductive system that has affected them, created, um, you know, made things, without getting too specific, it just made things go haywire and that's what killed them. Um, so even though it doesn't look like that is connected with their reproductive system, it actually in many, many ways it is. Um, and then the other thing that is super common is our, our respiratory issues. Mm. You know, you, you walk into the coop and there's a chicken that's sneezing repeatedly, or they have discharge, uh, coming out of their beak or their eyes. They've got some swelling going on. That's, that's pretty common too. And there's, you know, where I live, there's a lot of bacteria. There's also some viruses that can cause it. Um, and in any of these situations, I would just say, don't, you know, the number one thing is don't panic and don't immediately go to that place of my whole flock is going to die. You know, yeah. um, it's funny because we have, you know, we have our social media and there's a lot of chicken groups out there and, 
you know, we can go onto a forum or whatever and say, oh, I had a chicken die. And people will say like, I mean, people will say just the absolute worst case scenarios and it freaks yes. people out, Yes, you know, and we have to understand like, these are, these are living animals. They have bodies, you know, they are going, some of them are going to have problems. Um, it's a flock, you know, we have a, a number of chickens in a space. Um, so it, it's not necessarily the end of the world. If, if one of your chickens dies, even if it has some kind of respiratory issue, that doesn't mean your whole flock is going to get sick. You know, it, it's certainly there are serious situations out there. I don't want to mislead people, but I also don't want that to be the first place they go. Just like, oh my gosh, I have to call my whole flock because I've had, uh, you know, one or two chickens get a, a respiratory illness. So, yes. and I, yeah, you know, I'm very natural leaning, so I don't reach for antibiotics first thing. Um, I, I wouldn't really, unless I was working with a veterinarian that absolutely said, look, you need to give your chickens, um, you know, a preemptive dose of antibiotics. Um, I really don't recommend that being your first course of action, unless it's your only option. Yeah. I'm the same yeah. way with antibiotics. I'll use them if we ha absolutely have to, right? If I'm going to, yeah. if I can save the animal's life, I'll absolutely use an antibiotic, but otherwise I don't like to just do the blanket applications of those. Yes, because it, it, it can, it, it can bring down the resilience of your whole flock. Like it will, it will, it may help in the short term, but if you look at the long-term health of your flock, you will be bringing down the resilience of your whole flock. Whereas there would be members of your flock that would benefit from some exposure to whatever's going on and become stronger from it. So yes. yeah, it's tough. You know, you, we make those decisions. I make those decisions all the time and, and they're tough, but, um, just, I always tell people, remember, no matter what happens, those chickens have a better life than most chickens in the world. Yep. So just keep that in your mind, no matter what happens. They won the chicken lottery for sure. They did. So talking about antibiotics and such, it made me think of a, I think this could be a controversial topic, but I'm going to ask you anyway, because I'm curious to see what you'll Ooh. say. Ooh, I like, I like getting <laughs> spicy on occasion. I'm um, okay to fit. <laughs> so, um, there's a lot of blogs and a lot of people who talk about putting oregano or vinegar or herbs in like the water. There's always like, put, put a drop of oregano in your chicken's water and, and they'll never get sick. And I'm always like, I like that idea. Cause I, I mean, I love essential oils. I'm a naturally minded person, but I'm like, is there any actual data or evidence that that is helpful? Or is that kind of like a white, an old wives tale that just kind of floats around the, the world wide web? Well, um, there are studies, um, there are study, there are studies with oregano. There are, you know, concentrated forms of oregano. There are studies with, um, apple cider vinegar. Um, and there is some, there is some re research out there that does show that it, it can help kind of, um, especially with coccidiosis to keep, mm. to keep that at bay. Uh, that's a very common um, parasitic disease, intestinal disease that chickens will get. Um, but I, I, I can't not mention that the science is very limited. Okay. And what I will say is that lack of studies is not the same thing as studies that prove something wrong or right. You know, sure. it's, it, it, yep. it, it, it we, we have to keep that in mind. And most of the science that we have about backyard chickens comes through the lens of factory farms. So the way that we think about it, the way that we receive information is going to be beneficial for that environment. So right. keep that in mind. You know, I wish that there were more that, and it's getting, it's certainly getting better. Um, you know, now, now that there's more studies, a lot of times you have to go outside of the United States to find, um, find the information or the studies that you're looking for. Um, it is getting better, but it's not, there's just not the money in studying right. natural remedies that there is in, um, uh, 
uh, the synthetic things that they would be using in factory farms. Um, so, you know, with essential oils, my, my, uh, my recommendation is that I don't, I don't really recommend putting them in or on chickens directly. Um, but I will say, I'll say many people do it. A lot of the people that follow me, they will g give their chickens oregano oil. If they feel comfortable doing it, like I'm not going to tell them, oh, you know, that's really bad. You shouldn't be doing that. If they're observing um, some benefit to that, then I do think that that is, that is worth something. Like that observation is worth something. And, you know, when I think about what I will do if I come up against a situation with my flock and I don't know what to do, the first thing that I'm going to do is ask somebody with more experience than me. I'm going to go to like a farmer who's had chickens in their family for generations and find out what they're saying before I go to some scientific uh, blog. And I'm not anti-science. Okay. Right, I, sure, I tell sure. people that I'm not anti-science, yeah. but I do think that, and we're, we're, what we're seeing a lot of today is, you know, people, taking uh, traditional wisdom and kind of rebranding it as this new, you know, oh, well, we've discovered from the scientific research that this works. And it's like, well, you know, people have been doing that a long time. Right. <laughs> um, and they'll rename it, you know, they'll take like farming systems or whatever that people have been doing, you know, maybe indigenous people have been doing for however many years and they'll, they'll give it a new name and, presented as this new thing. And it's like, no, you know, that's, I'm glad that that information is getting out there. Um, but I think, I think that there is value in traditional wisdom. I so I'm not like completely, like I said, I'm not anti-science. I do think it's important to keep up with studies to, 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 you know, have some knowledge about what is actually being pro been proven and what hasn't been proven. But I also won't throw out traditional wisdom either. So there are some things that I do where I'm like, you know, look, I don't have a ton of scientific uh, uh, backing for this. Like I use homeopathics with my chickens, mm -hmm. homeopathic remedies. And I've been using homeopathics Oh my gosh. Let's see. I'm 48 now and I was 20 when I started using them. So that's a lot. <laughs> that's a that's long awesome. time ago. That's awesome. Almost 30 years. Um, and I don't have science. Like the homeopathics are really hard to do studies on in the, in the traditional way that we do studies. All I can say is, look, I'm going to give you this information because it's worked for me. You know, and I use, I also use flower essences, not, not like, uh, flower essences are not, um, not essential oils. It's, it's something right. different. It's kind of yeah. like, yeah, it's kind of like a homeopathy, but like on the emotional side. Mm -hmm. And so I, I will use those and I don't have scientific studies and people have asked me like, Hey, you know, where's the science behind this? I say, well, you know, I don't have that. And if you need it, then that's okay. But if you don't need it, that's okay. Like it's not, this isn't going to hurt your chickens. So if it's not harmful, it's not, if I don't feel that it's directly harmful, then I would say, you know, go for it and see how it works. Um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at with that. I don't know if yeah. that even answers your question. <laughs> no, that's helpful. It's very it's diplomatic. No, it's good. I, I like it. And I, I'm, I'm right with you. I like, I like having science, but I also know that there's, a, there's traditional wisdom. That's just not, the data is not there, but doesn't mean it's not real. It doesn't, doesn't not work. It just might not be in a white paper somewhere existing in some archive. Yes. So I'm with you. I, I do sometimes, I guess I have, I tend to be a little on, I mean, is, I'm pretty, I'm actually not pretty. I'm very natural and I'm very willing to try new things and I'm pretty crunchy, but, um, I also get a little tired. I feel like there's these darlings of the internet where like these, these little things that people pass around, they go around and around and around. And I'm like, but does anyone ever, tr like, does anyone even know if it works? Like, like, um, another, another one I think yeah. is a pumpkin seeds for wormer. And so if anyone ever talks in the homestead circles about having worms and their animals, everyone's just like, Oh, pumpkin seeds. And I'm like, 
I, I would love pumpkin seeds to work and maybe they do, but I'm like, I've never actually heard any results uh, quantified or not that they actually work. I've just known everyone. Recommends there is them. a very, yeah, there's a small study that, and there probably is more now, uh, but it, I think it was about two years ago. They did a small study that showed that it had some effect against, and, okay. but this is, this is like highly concentrated, highly concentrated right. pumpkin, pumpkin seeds. And so, you know, my wish is that there were more studies and so that we could create products with the, with the right amount in it, you know, with the right dosage so that we could be sure of what we were doing, but there's just not yeah. going to be, there's just not going to be those studies, you know, at least not yeah. right now. I think, I think, you know, in the future we could definitely see that. Um, right. but at the same time, I'm really careful not to be like, you know, there's a lot, <laughs> it's, there's, there's so much chicken drama. Like people get really upset at each other and yeah. there's these button point. Like if you talk about diatomaceous earth, if you talk about yes. apple cider vinegar, if you, talk about, <laughs> you know, people just start fighting and it's like, yeah. this is not world hunger. Okay. <laughs> <know> like, <laughs> it's like, why are we fighting? Yeah. And so I'll always say, you know, yeah, there's certain things I like to use, you know, um, I have observed them to work in my flock and if it, this is the chicken landia way, but it's not the only way. Yes. That's a good way to say it. I mean, it's a free yeah. country. You can do whatever you'd like. With yes. <laughs> you can use pumpkin seeds if you want to. I'm not going to like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to dox you on Twitter, you know? Exactly. <laughs> you lost your chicken card because of the pumpkin seeds. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, yes. The internet's a fun place. All right. Um, okay. My last, this has been a, this we're almost at an hour and this has been gone really fast. This has been a blast, but my last question for you, um, is another, I think a big issue for a lot of backyard chicken keepers. And I have struggled with this in the past and some years are better than others, but it's the topic of flies. How do you manage oh, yeah. flies in your coops and in your runs and all the chickeny places? Um, they have like these great products right now where the flies go into this little like trap thing. And then they, I don't know the name of the product, but they die. And then you can feed them back to the chickens. Uh, is it like a net? It, it's and, like a little cone yes. thing? Okay. I have one of those. Yes. Yes. And I will, I'm going to confess something that is so utterly ridiculous right now on your podcast. Okay. Your, I'm ready. Your I'm listeners ready. are going to switch off. <laughs> <laughs> I am so soft hearted that if I, I can't do it, I can't do the fly trap thing because I'll feel, I will literally feel sorry for the flies and yeah. then I'll like, let them go, you know? So and that's why I don't have like, the the grub farm or whatever you know people sure. are like why don't you grow your own grubs and stuff and it's like yeah i know i just feel bad feeding them to my chickens i know that's completely ridiculous and hopefully someday i can get over it but um so but i also recognize that that is just the most amazing thing like I, when i mm -hmm. saw that product I, those products start coming on the scene i was like okay this is great because it's such you know it's a great way to get some good nutrition into your chickens and also get rid of all those flies in your coop. Now, obviously, you know, flies come from maggots. So if you're allowing a lot of, uh, you know, you're, if you're, if your coop is getting really soiled, you know, if you're doing deep litter and you're not keeping it well turned, you know, these can, this can create a situation where that cycle gets started and it's really hard. Once that cycle starts, it's really hard to, um, you know, to get, to get it under control again. I'll tell you one thing that I really like is fly predators. So, um, what they are, are they're little tiny, teeny tiny wasps. Um, they don't sting. You don't even really see them because they're so small, but they feed on, on fly larvae. So, um, I will start, you've got to start early. You have to start before you see the flies. 
I will order the order those and I just get mine from Amazon, but you can probably, you might be able to get them even at like a local farm store. Sometimes I've seen them. Um, but you get them and then you have to, you have to put them in a place where your chickens aren't going to eat them because they come yes. in they're they're like eggs and then they hatch out. Um, so they, they usually send up, send these little, um, like these little mesh packs and you put them in the mesh pack and you can hang them up in your coop. And that really helps to keep the population down. You will still have flies. Um, it helps to remember, you know, that flies have a job. They're doing, a, they're doing something important in the environment. So you don't want to completely eradicate them, but any infestation is not good. Mm -hmm. So you keep, you keep the numbers down. And, um, I think, you know, using, using fly predators is, a, it's a little bit more expensive, unfortunately, but if you have a smaller coop and smaller flock, it's pretty easy to stay on top of them with that. And that, that's been my favorite thing. And then obviously, um, you know, if you have, I, I don't like the, the, um, fly tape. Oh, I mm. really just don't like that. Like I can't, I can't even with that. Um, <laughs> but the one, like the netting thing where you can catch the flies and feed them back to your flock, like that just, to me, that's just like genius. What's your favorite bait for that? I've pl I played with different things. I'm curious what you like to use. The bait in the, in the, in the net mesh, thing. I don't know. I'm thingy. not, I've not, I've not, I've never used it. Oh. So I would assume like, I don't know, like what, I don't even know what you could put in there. Like, can you put, I mean, I imagine if you put chicken poop in there, there'd be flies in there. Yeah. Um, my, I think we're, I think we're talking about the same one. It might be slightly different. Mine has like a little dish. No, wait, does it have a dish? Yeah. It has a dish in there that they are, they come in, they're attractive, they fly up and they can't get back out. But yeah. um, I've done milk, like raw milk from our cow. Cause they love, they love sticky, sweet, you know, milk. And then I've done fruit, yeah. like really ripe watermelon or whatever that's worked. Well. Yes. Yeah. 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 I think it, you know, just thinking of the things that flies love, um, I guess <laughs> you thinking I about like I know. <laughs> syrup, <laughs> syrup. I know the conversations we have on this podcast are so fun. <laughs> always like, what, what do flies love? Life? I'm talking about fly bait. <laughs> my career it's great <laughs> so oh my goodness but yeah um I've, I've i've done the fly predators in the past i love the idea of it because it feels like to me it just is like helping that natural cycle i have we have all the other animals and so i and we and i have like you know manure everywhere so i never could tell if yeah they were doing much for my chickens or you know it was like are you leaving me are you flying away but i love the idea of i it. yes I think the, you know, the, um, the, the bigger your operation is, the harder it is to, to yeah. use fly predators. Now I know that, you know, they sell them for horses and stuff, but you have to use a lot and it's expensive. That's what I ran into. Um, I there's I was... also like, yeah, it's expensive, but there's state. all, yeah, sorry. We're, yeah, we have a well, lot here guys. Yeah. So we're, we're, that's if we're sounding <laughs> over the top of each other, we're doing our best. <laughs> it's rural. Okay. Internet. Yes. Um, there's also products like first Saturday lime. I've heard a lot of good things about first Saturday lime. I have not used it, but I've heard a lot of good things about it. And in, in, in terms of controlling just bugs in general in your chicken coop, but definitely flies. Okay. That's a good one to check out too. Awesome. Okay. So we have lots of options here, guys. If you're thinking about the upcoming fly season, cause I already, I've seen a fly at my house. We just, we still have some snow on the ground a couple weeks ago and I still saw a fly like yesterday oh, wow. sitting on my computer. So I'm like, and so it begins, they are coming. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, there's some options for y'all. So this has been such a fun conversation, Dahlia, before we hop off, do you have any other last minute tips or advice to encourage all the people to get the chickens? I, the main thing that I will say to people is just to, to remember that we've been doing this for a really long time and you're not, you know, just remember that if you decide, if you're trying to decide, you know, can I do this? Is there, you know, people get nervous and stuff like, oh, I don't know if I should do this. This has been a way of life for humans for, for, you know, a really long time and likely in your family in 
probably maybe just a generation ago. So remember that, you know, listen to, listen to your heart, listen to your, your gut instinct and go from there and um, just keep on chicken on. That's what I tell people. <laughs> I love that. That's perfect. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm assuming your book is available all the places books are sold, the local bookstores, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, the usuals, or is there any other places? Yeah, that Tractor Supply, supply. Okay. yes. Tractor Supply, awesome. And where can they find you on the internet? Because I'm sure they're going to want to go follow along with what you're doing. Well, uh, my my biggest platform is my YouTube channel. It is called Welcome to Chickenlandia. I am on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as Welcome to Chickenlandia. Um, and then there's my podcast, uh, Bok Talk, and my website is welcome to chickenlandia.com. There you go, guys. Go follow Dahlia because she has some amazing content. And thank you so much for coming on today. I, I learned so much. This was just a fun conversation. I never thought we would be able to go so deep on the topic of just like humans relationship to chickens. I think that was my favorite part of the whole thing. Just kind of thinking yeah. about that and, and really examining how we got here. So that was awesome. Thank you so much. You are so welcome. Thank you.